Yeah, sure. Uh, appreciate it, Bill. Yeah, just fired up, like always. You know, we get to this final game, and um, man, I, I don't know if we could have asked for much more in the semifinals uh, with the way those those games played out. You know, Michigan and TCU going back and forth. Looked like Michigan might find a way to, to pull it out late, and then to the credit of TCU, the way they've done it all year, they uh, they once again uh, win a game late, which is, has kind of been their theme all year. And then with Ohio State and, and Georgia, man, Ohio State off of that Michigan game, I don't know if they could have executed any better in most areas. Um, and with the way Ryan Day was calling it and, and with the way C.J. Stroud was, was playing. But, again, credit to Georgia, um, the heart of a champion up against the, the, the ropes and just made enough plays there late to be able to, to get an opportunity to, to repeat something you just don't see very often in this sport. So – um, fired up to be here. I just got, I went home after the Rose Bowl <clears throat> and came back uh, today and fired up for, uh, for Monday night and all the build up and the hype uh, to get, get us ready. Kirk, before we get to questions, one more from me. Uh, you called an NFL game earlier this year with your busy schedule at SoFi. What are your, your thoughts on SoFi hosting its first uh, national championship game? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I obviously watched it. Uh, especially last year when the Rams were on, on a big run and they ended up in the Super Bowl. Um, I, I, I'm i an idiot. I thought it was, you know, a dome until I got there this year. And it's the most uh, unique setup that the, the architects uh, did when you, when you see it in person. Uh, it's fantastic. It's uh, got to be, uh, along with, I don't know, whatever other NFL stadium you want to put out there, state-of-the-art facility, but... It'll be, a, a, I think, for fans that come out here, even though there's there's some wind and rain, even though it's sunny out right now, um, I think people will be fired up to have a chance to to uh, to get in the stadium and and what what better setting uh, than SoFi for the national title? It'll be great. Thanks. We'll uh, we'll start with media questions. We'll go with Paul Newberry in Atlanta, followed by Matt Baker at the Tampa Bay Times. Go ahead, Paul. Hi, Kirk. How you doing? Good. A uh, couple for me. First of all, a year, a little over a year ago at this time, uh, Georgia had lost in the SEC championship, and there were a lot of people calling for Kirby Smart to make a quarterback change, go back to JT Daniels. You know, Stetson Bennett can't win a national title. I'm just curious, looking back on that, what does that Kirby's decision to stick with Stetson kind of say about Kirby and, and you know, what he's done with this program and kind of his confidence and, and making tough decisions and, and just kind of the... the I don't know. That seems to kind of epitomize sort of what he's done to build up, build Georgia into kind of this uh, new dynasty in college football. Without a doubt. You know, I, I think what an opportunity they have Monday to, to kind of be the new bar in the sport. If they're not already, um, Kirby's kill, uh, created a, a very consistent brand. Uh, the decision on, on Stetson, <clears throat> he'll be the first one to tell you, and I'm sure he's told you Paul this cause he's pretty open about it, that, that he, and, and, and um, uh, he and all the offensive coaches kind of struggled with the idea of him being the guy last year and, and really thought J- was hoping JT Daniels would get healthy and get back and, and be the guy to, to lead them to wherever they were going last year. And all Stetson Bennett did was keep making plays and keep making plays. And like you said, he came up short in Atlanta. I didn't realize that there were a lot of people questioning if he was the guy at that point. I, I thought that was more middle of the year, but um, regardless, whenever the decision was made and, however much noise was on the outside of the program, uh, the, the, the little guy just kept battling and kept making plays. And I think even the coaches kind of threw their hands up in the air and said, man, we, this guy gives us our best chance to win. And I think last year in that championship game against Alabama, that second half, I mean, I, they went from like, oh, gosh, what are we going to do to put the ball in his hands? And I don't want to say he won it for him, but I know his playmaking ability and a lot of those throws late in that game had a lot to do with how they won that game. And then he comes back this year <clears throat> as a kind of a seasoned veteran. And I think now he's, he's kind of the face of, of the offense in the program. So it's incredible. Uh, the journey, you could, you could honestly write a movie script on, on his story. Um, I'm excited to see if he gets an opportunity to, to write this final chapter the way, the way he wants, but it's been a lot of fun to watch this guy against all odds, proving everybody, including his own coaches and his own fans wrong to the point of potentially winning back-to-back national titles. But for me personally, as a college football nut, uh, I'll never forget 
you know, what, what, uh, what he's done and, and how he had to prove people wrong along the way. One more for me, too, with TCU being in this, uh, you know, there was kind of a, a thought that the championship game had become kind of stale or uh, was stale, you know, the same teams in it every year, a few SEC powerhouses, Clemson and Ohio State. Um, what is, how much excitement do you think it brings having somebody like TCU in this game? And, and do you think we could see more of this when we go to the 12-team playoff? Yeah, I think so. I, I think it's great to, to have a new face and, and especially their story where they were five and seven. They fired their coach. They brought in a, well, they didn't fire him. He, he stepped down. And they brought in a new coach and um, really across town from SMU. And here he is in his first year. And, and by the way, I'm sure you've looked at it. I mean, there's five or six different games that a lot of people thought, OK, that's a fun story. They're They're gone. And they just kept finding a way to win games and coming back. And, and, you know, of course, the grand fashion was the game against Baylor, last second walk-off field goal. That's kind of symbolic of, of their season, really. And even against Michigan, kind of a back-and-forth game. So not only just a new face, but their story and what they had to do to get here. And, man, it just doesn't seem that long ago TCU was in the Mountain West and trying to get respect from people around the country, and they had an opportunity to play um, against – and an opportunity to play against Wisconsin in the Rose Bowl and and obviously took full advantage of that. And I think that really helped their brand that day. And then and then eventually to join the Big 12. And a lot of people still don't respect them. And then to have this year, um, I think a lot of people, if you if you were really taking a poll with Georgia fans, they don't know a whole lot about TCU. So to me, that that's fun, you know, because they're they're not gonna back down, I assure you, and they're incredibly confident. And I think it's going to be a great game. And to answer your, your second question, yeah, I think with the 12-team playoff, I think there's definitely an opportunity uh, not only to obviously see new faces, but for teams like TCU to potentially make a run to get, to get into the big stage like this. We'll go to Matt Baker next, followed by John Lewis. Go ahead, Matt. Hey, Kirk. I appreciate the time. Uh, obviously, Georgia and TCU, their rosters are built differently. And TCU is maybe more involved in the portal than anybody that's been at this stage in the, in the playoff era. Uh, how do you kind of view TCU's roster makeup? Do you, do you think that kind of more lean on the portal is a sustainable, viable model for other teams? Or does TCU just kind of catch lightning in a bottle here? <clears throat> well, I think all of us are kind of learning, right? I mean, as, as we go along here, you know, we saw Michigan State a couple years ago um, hit it big. We saw USC hit it big this year uh, until the very end where they, they lost the Pac-12 championship and lost their bowl game, but obviously had a great year from where they were the year before. So I think new coaches in new situations, the first two or three years, those are the guys that are really – I think needing to flip their roster around and what better way to do it. It's like the NFL with free agency. But I think your, your point is for me, as I sit here just a couple of years into this transfer portal, I think it's kind of like uh, the NFL. You build longevity with the draft and you build your foundation with the draft and in college football recruiting. Um, but then if you need a right guard or you need a safety or you need a linebacker, you, you go into the portal and you, and you pick some pieces, I think. I think that's more sustainable. I think that's probably where people will eventually get. But these new coaches, um, it, you know, and they, they inherit a roster. Maybe guys don't buy into their culture. Maybe they need – they have a weakness, an offensive line. You know, what we're seeing is people go out and, and pick people up as quickly as they can to try to replenish a roster. So that, that makes a lot of sense to me. But I really think that – I really think that um, the, the future of, of most programs is going to be still recruiting and, and still go through, um, you know, kind of cherry picking and finding different guys that might uh, meet the needs that you have. Okay, we'll go to John Lewis, followed by Zach at the New York Post. Uh, go ahead, John. All right. Hey, uh, thanks a lot for taking the time today, Kirk. Appreciate it. Uh, just a question. You obviously now cover both the NFL and college football. Uh, there's been a lot of concern in college football circles about the NFL kind of encroaching on college football's territory, the Black Friday game starting next year that you'll actually be doing for Amazon. But also this past New Year's, you know, January 2nd, because uh, New Year's fell on a Sunday, you had an NFL game in that Sugar Bowl time slot. And it seems like the NFL overshadowed 
college football on one of its top days of the year, the least watched Rose Bowl ever, least watched Cotton Bowl in many years. As someone who covers both sports, do you think that this competition is going to maybe get to a point where college football is really kind of set back, kind of the way the NBA is on Christmas Day? Um, you know, my my hope, and I, I don't know all the answers to the logistics, um, but I, I do wish that there was a, a, a set date where it was a little bit more fan friendly for college football, you know, like, like Saturday nights, um, you know, like the national championship being on a Monday night. I know I hear from fans all the time, how, how tough that is for people on the East coast, you know, to try to stay up, um, on, on these games. Um, and I've always heard about the NFL, you know, and college football trying to be good partners and, the NFL uh, in a perfect world would, would be respectful of what the college football traditional territory has been. I, I you know, I, I'd like to think that uh, that the league and, and the decision makers from college football could get on the same page as we move forward to this, uh, this 12 team playoff. I don't know what the answers are, honestly, because like you said, the NFL seems to be growing, you know, and looking for different time uh, opportunities to, to, show their product off and they're the king let's face it i mean in all sports you throw the nba mlb anything out there and the nfl is clearly uh number one i don't think college football i i, I don't know you, you probably have researched it john i i think college football is number two um in, in this country um and i i know as a an avid fan of both the, the uh the leagues or the sports i would love to see them be able to work um, behind the scenes. I just feel the college football right now, who, who are the leaders, you know, who, who's making the decisions to ultimately try to have those kind of conversations. It's most definitely not the NCAA. Um, I'm very anxious to see where our future goes as we get ready for this 12 team playoff, as we still wait for more realignment. There's so many unknowns right now in college football. You know, John, we might have a commissioner, like Roger Goodell, we might have, who knows, maybe that's our future. Maybe maybe breaking away from the NCAA and creating its own governing body and creating its own world and, and, and partnering with the Players Association and, and creating a CBA. You know, if that is the future, which I don't know if it would be, um, because there's just it's just such an unknown. So right now I think it's just a mess. I think the sport of college football across the board is a mess uh, in a lot of different uh, areas. And I think um, trying to find one person to represent the sport, to talk on its behalf to Roger Goodell and, and the league, I don't know if that exists right now. So I think college football has to get their world kind of aligned and figure that out and then figure out who the leader is and then go forward with trying to find a, a way to partner with the NFL and try to work together on, on dates and times and things of that nature. All right. Hey, thanks a lot. Yep. Thank you, John. We'll go to Zach of the New York Post, followed by George Somerville. Go ahead, Zach. I you just see someone's headline for Kirk Street says college football's a mess. Yeah. <laughs> Take it out of context. Kirk, how are you? Good. Um, so I had two things. First, I wanted to ask you, can you – I was kind of trying to think back. I mean, can you ever remember I mean, no. uh, a Cinderella quite like this, TCU? I mean, a team that – was it didn't get a single vote in the preseason was five and seven last year was you know basically counted out all year eight point underdog in the semis now they're a 13 and a half year i mean could you ever i mean i'm trying i've been trying to think back like it feels like in the last 20 25 years we we've never really had a story quite like this not to this level no and i, I wish the bear was on here he could he could probably tell us off the top of his head who <laughs> Who, who who these big underdogs have been um, that, that make it, you know, Cincinnati, of course, was in a semi, but not, not all the way to the title. Um, I, I can't remember uh, th this big of underdog um, off the top of my head. I, I remember when Ohio State played Miami in 02, they were a pretty big underdog, but they were still Ohio State, still with that big brand. So, no, man, I, I, I really can't. And, and not to mention, if you go back, not just to this week, but you bring up a good point. If you go back to August, I mean, how many people were in Las Vegas saying, yeah, let, let me, let me put $10 down on TCU, you know, to win right. a national title. I, I don't know if anybody was including their own fan base. 
So, and, and I mean, think of their story. Max Duggan is a guy that's been around for, for four years and he doesn't even start with a new coaching staff, you know, to start the season, to break camp, they go Chandler Morris and, and he gets, he gets dinged up and they go back to Duggan. I mean, that, that gives you an idea of what they thought of Max Duggan, right? And, that, and then he becomes the leader in the face of his team and a Heisman finalist. So, yeah, this is a this is a team that's kind of been against all odds all year, and um, don't tell them they don't have a chance Monday night. I mean, they they actually tell them that. They, I think they like to hear it because it sen- it seems to fire them up. But if anybody does an article on how many four stars and five stars are on the two rosters, you would think you know why are we even playing the game on Monday night. But as we all know, um, it's more about how a team comes to together and, and what it ends up becoming and TCU is a great example of that and my other thing is with with George I mean do you I mean when you see them and kind of what they're now you know have accomplished the last few years do, do you see them almost as like a new do they remind you of what Alabama was yeah I mean for sure I not not so much what Alabama was well I mean they're still obviously great I mean but I think Alabama's still Alabama uh, I know they've been off here or there, a tick here. They, they lost the last play of the game to Tennessee, last play of the game to LSU. I'm, I'm still a huge believer in, in Nick Saban in Alabama. But I do take – I know what you're saying because I agree with you. And I do think that Georgia – I already feel that Georgia's right there. Now, if they win Monday night, you know, we, game day travels all over the country yeah. and these teams I always say, we want Bama, uh, you know, we want Bama. They're going to have to update that to we want Georgia. I mean, Georgia is recruiting at as high a level as anybody since Kirby's been there. Most importantly, they're developing players as well as anybody. To his credit, I think he learned a lot of this when he's a young uh, coordinator. He's found a way to not take your foot off the gas. He's found a way to keep the, you know, the motivation and find a way to get a chip on your shoulder and get pissed off at the world the way, the way uh, teams that win all the time. It's unique to try to do that. It's hard. That's why we don't see teams repeat very often because you just lose a little bit of an edge. And Georgia, man, they uh, how many times have they shown up flat over the last two or three, four years? Sometimes they get beat, but right. it's not because they laid an egg or showed up flat. So, no, he's doing – Kirby is doing an amazing job, and um, I think most people that, that follow the sport on a national level would recognize that and definitely put him either equal to Bama or if he wins Monday – yeah, like you said, he's the new the new standard in the sport. Right. Thanks, Kirk. Yep. Okay, next we'll go to George, followed by Larry Snyder at WLS. Go ahead, George. Hi, Kirk. Thanks for doing this. Um, you touched a little bit on Max Duggan. Uh, both quarterbacks have overcome significant adversity to get to where they are today. Um, I hope you don't mind me saying, but, but you also had uh, adversity in your college career. Can, can you talk to the mental toughness required to – overcome these obstacles for student athletes yeah and it's 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 uh, everybody has a different story you know there, there's some guys that come in as a five star they walk right on the field and play right away and go off to the nfl three years later and and uh that, that that's that's not the norm but that, but it happens i think most people have a story where they they hit some adversity that's why the transfer portal is such an interesting uh thing i think it's it's good for people and i Sometimes I wish uh, guys would be willing to, to stay in there and kind of fight the, the fight and, and really grow and develop as, as a person. Um, but I, I, I think everybody, not everybody, but again, going back to my earlier comment, I think most people face whether it's playing time or it's an injury or it's something that prevents you from right away or a better player ahead of you. You know, sometimes whatever it is, you, you, you face it. And either it's a great assistant coach, a position coach, a coordinator, um, a parent, high school coach, family members, whoever it might be. You know, these guys go in with such pressure <clears throat> and such expectations that when they, they don't live up to those initially, I know it can be really hard for a lot of these guys, um, especially in this social media era that they live in. Um, and, and, yeah, I, I know from talking to guys every week that, that they rely on whoever their support staff is to help them get through, you know, those tough times. It could even be a starter like CJ Stroud who has a bad game, you know, not even a really a bad game, but the team has a bad game against Michigan. And then, you know, you deal with it then, you know, so 
I don't think you're ever immune to dealing with it. There's nothing you could ever do to protect yourself from it. You're going to have to learn to cope with adversity. And, um, you know, these guys are no different today than they were, you know, going back, you know, in the 60s, 70s, 80s. You know, it's always kind of been the case. I think the difference is now the coverage and the attention uh, on the sport and, of course, social media and how toxic uh, that can be that these guys have to be able to cope with. All right, next is Larry Snyder, followed by Charles Baggerly. Go ahead, uh, Larry. Hey, Kirk, uh, as to the game, <laughs> watching the semifinal, the over-under for this game is around 62. You know, watching the semifinals, they may get that by halftime. <laughs> but what, you know, sometimes things are played a little tighter. Well, what's your take on that? As to what I'm with you. game? Man, I'm with you. I, I, I would see points. You know, I, I think... Um, and Kirby, when we sat down with him leading into to last week's game against Ohio State, we were asking him kind of the same subject, just about Ryan Daybrick made it pretty clear that he thought he'd have to score the mid to high 40s to win the game because of the respect he had for, for Georgia's offense. And I, and I also think that Kirby brought up a good point about the wear and tear of, of the season and how you get a long layoff and how the tackling – um, is always a concern and how tough it is to stay sharp on the defensive side of the ball, you know, for this kind of, this kind of run. Now, maybe it'll be better because they just finally played a game last week. Maybe they'll be able to, you know, make some, some, uh, some corrections off of some of the mistakes that the defense has made. But um, I'm, I'm with you. I, I think these two quarterbacks the style of offenses that they run, I see a lot of points. You know, I, I think if you get a stop in the, this kind of game, I think it's a win. If you get a stop in the red area, <clears throat> it's a win. If you can get a punt, uh, obviously, it's a massive win or a turnover. Um, because I I just I, I see a lot of speed uh, for TCU on the perimeter and in the backfield. I haven't heard the latest on Kendra Miller if he's going to be able to go. But they've got great backs, even if he can't. And then obviously, they got speed at receiver. And this Georgia secondary the last couple times out against LSU and Ohio State, uh, they've been vulnerable. And and here comes another team that, that can that can make you pay for that. So, um, and we always know what Georgia's capable of doing on the other side of the ball offensively. So, but yeah, I'm with you, man. I I think it's the back and forth type of game with with a lot of uh, a lot of playmakers and a lot of speed and a lot of points. <clears throat> Thanks. Okay, hey, now we'll go, we'll go to Charles, and now and then we'll go to Liam at Minute Media. Go ahead, Charles. What are your thoughts on Coach Dykes coming in and, and succeeding at this level in his first year? And also, how much credit does Gary Patterson deserve for the team's success right now? Yeah, I think Gary, obviously, for what he did there, the recruiting that he did, um, you know, the, the, the culture that he created that, that Sonny Dykes inherited, you know, even though they didn't win a lot of games last year, he inherited uh, a roster, not not full of uh, you know of guys that uh, you would think were capable of winning a ton of games, but it was good character, good substance, uh, good foundation. And then I think the timing of Sonny Dykes being in that area, knowing the players, learning the players pretty quickly. He, he credits his his strength staff, you know, for coming in and 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 really getting after it, kind of set a new standard for the direction that they were going to go. Maybe some new juice, some new, <clears throat> some new blood. You know, I think maybe it was good for the, for the uh, returning players. Um, but he, how much credit does uh, Sonny Dykes deserve? Or what, what can you say about the job that he did? And TCU, not just last year, in the last, last few years, they've, they've had some decent games, but they just lack consistency. And to be able to, to have this kind of run, um, is a major credit to Sonny Dykes, who I've known since, I mean, for a long time, going back to even before Cal, uh, watching him as a, as a, as a young uh, assistant. Um, and he's got, I'm sure you've been around him, he, he's got a, a competitive spirit about him that most of these coaches have, and he's just got a way about him that I think relates to the, to the current player. And so it's not shocking to me that, that he's doing well. A little bit surprising, I think, for all of us in his first year, and uh, considering some of the obstacles they've had to overcome, that they're here in the national title. But um, you, know, you look at what he's already doing with the, the, uh, the portal moving forward in the next year. You know, th I don't think this is a one and done thing for, for TCU. 
I think uh, Sonny Dykes has got something right now that's pretty unique, and I'm excited to see where, where it can go, not just Monday night, but moving forward after this. Okay, we'll go to Liam next, followed by Matthew Loftus. Go ahead, Liam. Hey, Kirk. Appreciate you taking the time, man. Sure. Uh, you're going to be on the call with Chris Fowler again this Monday for the national championship game. You guys have had, obviously, a ton of experience with each other in the booth, and that kind of stands out to you know what you were doing this fall, building a partnership with Al Michaels for Amazon. Can you speak a little bit to the advantages that the kind of familiarity you have with Fowler gives you when you're in the booth, especially for a game like Monday's national championship game? Yeah, but, um, it's a lot like probably, you know, your job or if we're, t- we're talking about football, I, you know, just, just the familiarity with your partner, um, the cadence of a broadcast, the, um, you know, just the look of an eye. You know, we, you know, you're looking at each other, might be an eyebrow raise, might just be little things that, you know, you sometimes hear quarterback and receivers talk about. They just kind of know each other. They, 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 they kind of feel each other. Um, I think that's probably the best way to describe it. I've been working with him on, you know, for on game day, I worked with him for over two decades. And, and then on, on the, uh, the Saturday night game, I've been working with him since 14. And so when you work with somebody for that, um, that much time and that many games, you just, you just kind of, it becomes very natural, very comfortable something you know my first year with Al was very interesting to work Thursday night with Al who's maybe the greatest to ever do it and Fred Gadelli was the producer and he Fred Gadelli and, and Al go back to John Madden and then Chris Collinsworth and so for me to kind of step in not a new producer and a new play-by-play guy but a producer and a play-by-play guy that had been together for a long time and done so many big events and then to kind of step in line with them, it wasn't all of us learning something new. It was me kind of learning Al and, and Freddie. And that was a, a really, um, that was kind of a, a challenge within itself, not just calling the game. And um, and then to leave that and then to go to, to Saturday, it was almost like going home, you know, when I would go to, to Saturday. It was, it was very interesting to, to go through that. And then, you know, as I got more and more reps with Al, as we did, I think it ended up being I think 15 or 16 games. Um, you could just start to feel his rhythm and his cadence. And so, you know, I got more and more comfortable uh, working with Al as well. So, yeah, but get, getting back to Chris, without a doubt, I think all this time we've been together um, allows us to really feel uh, one another and feed off of one another as well. Thank you, Kurt. Appreciate it. Sure. Okay, we'll go to Matthew now, followed by uh, Paul Livingood. Go ahead, uh, Matthew. Hey, thanks for this, um, and thanks again for bringing the Trojans to see. Uh, I was wondering which team's Achilles heel is, is going to be most threatening them winning the championship. I've seen both teams exposed. Both be exposed. Or one, no, or else capable is being Ohio State and TCU. So which team do you think has the biggest Achilles heel and how would they run it? Did Go, that come hear, through? No, I'm sorry. I, I, I think I heard Achilles heel. Yeah. Like of, heel. like of the team's yeah, weaknesses, is there one that's more glaring than the other? Glaring than the other. Well, I, I think that – I think the, the biggest thing is going to be, Matt, I'm sorry, man, we're just kind of cutting in and out there. I'll do the best I can. Hopefully it answers your question. The, the, the biggest uh, concern I have for Georgia is, is going to be, can they get pressure on Duggan? Can, can they get to Duggan before that, that those wide receivers can make plays against the secondary, which is an obvious uh, concern for Georgia, especially after the last couple of games. Um, you know, and I would have said against TCU, if you, if you and I would have spoken before the TCU Michigan game, I thought, okay, like everybody else, man, how are they going to hold up at the line of scrimmage? You know, they don't have the biggest people at the line of scrimmage, especially in the defensive front. <clears throat> how are they going to be okay? But somebody forgot to tell D winners and, and the TCU defense. And I know they ended up giving up some, some scores up, but 
I didn't look at it like, oh my gosh, they're getting blown off the ball. I, I didn't really sense that, you know, that three, three, five that they play. I think they were playing with their hair on fire, kind of anxious to show that they could, they could stand up against the run. And Donovan Edwards got out early, but for the most part, you know, I think Michigan made some plays through the air. And that would be my other concern for TCU is how do they match up uh, also against Stetson Bennett, and those tight ends and, and even the receivers. So I think it's, I think it's both teams are going to be able to have opportunities to throw the football. Uh, TCU does a, a pretty good job of, of getting pressure on the quarterback. So I think can they corral Stetson Bennett? They're going to be able to be back there creating, making plays. So you know, it's, it's kind of both teams' biggest Achilles to me is defending uh, the, the quarterback's creativity and then the big play ability through the air is, I think, going to be something to watch for both these defenses.